Hello. Can you hear me now? Okay. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I'm just going to make a... <laughs> what? They have to come. They have to come, yeah. This is, your, this is a requirement. <laughs> Mark Linder doesn't have to come, so thank you for coming. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to make a, um, a few very, very short remarks. Um, I want to, the whole idea for this symposium um, started when uh, uh, Tarek and Larry Davis and I were talking about themes for third year. So the seeds for um, what is now a much longer series grew out of that discussion um, at the beginning of the semester. Really, on behalf of all of the third year faculty that is here, I want to thank Larry, um, the undergraduate chair, and Dean Speaks, who's also up there, for um, turning this series into something that it was um, much more, was much bigger than we had originally planned and much more ambitious. Um, to kick off this series, we're starting with um, a discussion about North America with Roger Sherman and Michael Dennis, who Larry will introduce um, in more detail. And Francisco Sinin, who I think you all know pretty well, um, is moderating. Uh, I think it's going to be a pretty lively debate, um, knowing the constituents um, and the speakers involved. Um, as I said, this is the first of a series of three um, events. The first one is about North America. The second one will be about um, Asia, density in Asia. I didn't say that this is called density through thick and thin. I think you know all that. Um, at the second event, Fei Wang and Bing Bu um, will be joining us and Dean Speaks will be moderating. That's on um, the 11th of October. And then next semester, um, we'll have a much bigger event with um, economists and ecologists, architects, of course, and urban designers. Um, who will be talking about density and the city, um, hopefully in um, other ways. Um, so, the format for that and the location will change. It might not always be here. We might hold it out in the, in the atrium or in um, larger venues in the university, but uh, we're all looking forward to that and hope that when you're not required to come, <laughs> you will also come to those events. So, to expand on what we're doing today, there. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. I'll just see this one. Um, thanks, Liz, uh, and everyone for coming. I think this is hopefully the beginning of a, a way of maybe also looking at the curriculum through specific issues and how those issues speak to the core of the discipline and how those issues themselves are always in a sort of state of trans transition, translation, if you will. Uh, again, thanks, Liz, uh, Tarek, uh, the dean, Francisco, uh, for contributing your ideas, and particularly to Michael uh, Dennis, who is a architect from Boston who practices and speaks to the idea of of cities in a, a dense situation, and Roger Sherman, who is coming to us from LA. He's a visiting critic and a senior architect at Gensler, uh, LA. And of course, he's going to be speaking to us about something that's perhaps a little more hmm, relaxed, a little less dense, at least obviously dense. I think it's dense in other ways. Um, then again, just another sort of pitch for the, the next one, which is in a couple of weeks, Tuesday, uh, Bing Bu and Fei Wang will be speaking about, again, a similar pairing, uh, a sort of super dense situation in Shanghai. And then I think Fei Wang is doing uh, some research about uh, development that's happening outside the city, a sort of enclave, if you will. Uh, in that way, it's arguably a very traditional kind of uh, uh, less dense situation in the suburbs, and it will be moderated by our team, who again is someone who knows a lot about the uh, topic in Asia. And so this is this is interesting because I think we're talking about uh, this issue as it affects our school directly. We have obviously a presence here in North America, but also 
increasingly so uh, across the world. Anyway, back to density here. Density has long been an issue in the design of our collective built environments. The degree of spatial and programmatic compactness is at the heart of how we artfully occupy buildings, cities, and landscapes, and how we make relationships between them. Density directly affects the amount and kind, as well as the experience of our social interactions. Whether density creates shared identity through shared space, uh, a la Colin Rowe, Rossi, um, people like that from the 70s, and, or interprets the city as a montage stage set of events, I'm thinking of someone like Bernard Schumi and his uh, event cities, uh, in, or is an engine of creativity that is the result of an intense proximity of multiple different functions const and constructed identities. I'm thinking again here of Cool House uh, and Delirious New York, the city of the captive globe, or is defined as a culturally specific aspiration in an attempt to relax our control of social communication in the private worlds of observing. And I'm thinking here of someone like Teddy Cruz and a studio Cruz in San Diego uh, and Tijuana. Density is an essential ingredient in how we consciously and subconsciously occupy and arrange our worlds. Um, so these are, I would argue, kind of important, not certainly the only ones, but important reference points to this kind of a conversation that I hope we have today. I mean, you could also throw in there Venturi Scott Brown and the sort of density of symbols. Again, another kind of important historic reference point when we're talking about a kind of compactness of something and what happens as a result. Um, the combined pressure of our, today though, there's a lot of different things sort of acting on this issue. The combined pressures of our global population explosion, measurable and alarming ecological stress, and projected food and clean water shortages uh, force questions about uh, settlement optimization. This means density and its related issues take on new urgency. The pressure suggests that those who make policy and design and design our future environments must develop a complex qualitative understanding of density and grasp how it affects the making of urban patterns. All urbanized 21st century settlements will in some way be affected by the shifting pieces of a complicated equation that includes resource consumption, environmental performance, economic opportunity, social integration, cultural shifts, periodic mass migration, and the balance and ambition of political agendas. While the intensity of this set of circumstances is perhaps unprecedented, they are arguably also pers persuasive or pervasive and per perpetual forces that are as old as the cities themselves that they influence. Um, they've always changed, uh, but the way we imagine and combine them, of course, is unique from circumstance to circumstance. It's commonly assumed that urban compactness is more environmentally friendly, economically efficient, and socially desirable. Recent studies, however, have mixed conclusions. Two studies by Aalto University in Finland and a series of studies by people like Joan Nassar at Michigan are noteworthy in particular because they identify the ecological advantages actually of lower density configurations. Their work is part of a growing body of measurable research that notes that urban mass tends to sometimes overheat. City centers in desirable cities are increasingly unaffordable. And in the territory between our cities, the cultural appetite for privacy continues to drive the diffuse arrangement of settlement patterns. It's a tricky moment for the issue and a big reason why we're having the conversation on the topic now. How should we optimize density physically, physically, functionally, and culturally? Should we design for an increasingly compact urban core and condition ourselves to either kind of get used to it environmentally and economically, or design ways to temporarily, temporarily escape it, its negative effects? Should we take the opposite approach and spread out across the landscape, allowing for the sufficient light and air with the aim of engineering systems and services uh, our corporal that, that serve our corporal needs uh, and social needs efficiently and ecologically. 
through, for example, systems like electric driverless cars and ride shares, or use landscape strategies that promote increased vegetation to absorb greater amounts of greenhouse gases. We have lots of students, actually, who do thesis projects about this. So it's an issue, I think, that's present in people's mind. Is there a sweet spot? I think this is an interesting question. Uh, between these two extremes, and how do we measure it? These are just a few of the questions uh, that uh, urban density in the 21st century will have to address. As with mo most architectural urban issues, the response often pairs measurable data against culturally driven and fluid aspirations of identity and lifestyle. This symposium series offers an arena to discuss the current and near future status of a fundamental quality of the built environment. The stakes are high. Architects and urban designers must be partners in the design of desirable, culturally negotiated, and environmentally and economically sustainable environments. If we are not, the results might be devastating. Well, they will be devastating, I'm sure. Faced with the threat of our extinction, current modes of cannot be sustained. We are now required to rethink the nature of human settlement and how we live in cities and indeed uh, how we live on the planet. So our first speaker is Michael Dennis. Uh, he's considered one of the most influential thinkers and designers to emerge from the 1970s school of thought centered on the influential ideas and techniques of Colin Rowe, who taught down the road at Cornell. In practice since 1981, uh, Michael has also taught at MIT since the early 90s. He also taught at Harvard, Kentucky, Princeton, UVA, Yale, Michigan, Rice, a lot of places. This is a job problem. What? This is a job problem. It's a job problem. Oh, okay. I thought these. Well, <laughs> it's impressive. <laughs> His very influential and widely read book, A Court and Garden From French Hotel to the City of Modern Architecture, is a carefully researched and wonderfully illustrated call for the application of spatial strategies of uh, pre modern European cities that emphasize the importance of the public realm. Please welcome Michael Dennis. I think, does, is this, does this work? Can you hear me? I have a dude in here that, uh... It has to be attached to the place so that it's recorded. Is it muted? I think it's... It's it what? You have to turn it on. Turn it it's on. on. It's on. It might not be. Oh, it's on. It should be on. So, does it work? Does it work? Does it work? Here, make it a little higher. How about that? How about that? No. Can you hear me? Well, it's easier if I don't. Uh, okay. Can I see this? This one works, I know. Oh, okay. I think this one's better. This one. I'll turn it Can you try it now? It's, it I think it's on. It, this one's on. Now try it. Oh, now it's good. This one's on mute. Okay, let's uh, take this off. How about that? That's perfect. Fantastic. Can you hear my heart beating from nerves? Here, here's this part. And I'll pick this Well, thank you uh, for inviting me. I spent a lot of my life in this part of the country and it's nice to be back among friends, especially because when you go to a symposium you always worry that you're, you're the one they invite to throw the eggs at, right? You're going to be the one that's set up. And I sound a little bit like Donald Trump, but uh, <laughs> the system is rigged. It's very comforting to know though that Roger Sherman and I have been friends for over 35 years and He's one of the most talented architects I've ever seen, like light years uh, above his contemporaries. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion, but give me a podium and I turn evangelical. <laughs> Do I have any slides? Yeah, we need to get you all set up here. So while that's going on, uh, I have honestly put for you students, two primary goals. 
One is I want to scare the crap out of you. And secondly, I want to convince you to change the world because it's, this is way too loud, isn't it? No, no it's okay. <clears throat> and I think, it, uh, I think it desperately needs changing. Uh, I have a, basically a polemic that we can talk about a little bit more uh, when we sit down. Contemporary environmental issues are unprecedented today and are the most important issues facing global society. They're going to get worse before they get better, if they in fact do get better. And the big question is whether <clears throat> global society can act and act in time to, to avert chaos and extinction. And I'm not exaggerating, it's no accident that there are several books out now about extinction of life on the planet. It's the sixth, it would be the sixth time that it's happened. And it could very easily happen. We humans are the problem. Our numbers and our lifestyles, especially in the developed world, are the problem. And the facts are known, at least they're known enough that we can uh, act practically and prudently. And it's not just about global warming, that's the elephant in the room, but there are other issues as well, having to do with non-renewable resources and with renewable resources. <clears throat> it's also about waste, poisoning the planet. So what can we do as professionals? We can do a lot because we have a major effect on these things. That's why the discussion about density is really, really important. And it has to be about the environment as well. Number one, we can learn what the issues are, which is, takes some time. Uh, secondly, we can learn how they affect architecture and urbanism. We can learn how to make urban design architecture and, and learn how to make urban architecture that makes urban design. Because, uh, and here's a challenge for Roger there. Uh, the dispersed way we live is the single biggest contributor to environmental problems that we have, especially in America. The city is the answer, not the problem. We need to learn to live simpler, closer, more compact, and less mobile. We need to drive less. And driverless cars are not the answer. And electric driverless cars are not the answer because electricity is produced two-thirds of it by fossil fuels and half of that is lost in transmission. What we need are carless drivers. So, is this the one that does the changing? Yeah. So let's begin with the scare part. Uh, in 1970, as you can see there, three MIT systems analysts did a study about several categories of uh, environmental things. Non-renewable -re resources remaining, food per capita, services per capita, the white line is uh, population, industrial output, and global pollution. In 2000, they went back, the dotted lines are, are projections based on the data that was before that. In 2000, they went back and did the same analysis of what had happened in the preceding 30 years. <clears throat> and those solid lines are the answer to that. Uh, that's what the data represents. So you can see they're not exact, but they generally follow the pattern that they had predicted. Then they did a projection <coughs> forward which is stunning, I would say. Uh, they're predicting that there will be population declining after 2030, following economic collapse, because the economy is part of the environment as well. And you can see that the non-renewable resources uh, are plummeting. And it's all fairly straightforward and understand, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but this is one projection. Now, do you know what this is? Any of you students? 
this is your career. <laughs> if you have a 50 year career, that's what you're gonna be dealing with. So you need to think ahead a little bit because your career is gonna be dealing with completely different issues than mine and Roger's and Francisco's. We, we, we had dinner on the grass. We were on the uphill side of that. But you're gonna to have to think about architecture and life and urbanism in a completely different way. <clears throat> Just quickly, these, you, you could spend an awful lot of time on this, but this is about uh, uh, petroleum, about oil. Doesn't matter what you look at in here, the point is it's all going down. And don't listen to all the BS about shale oil and stuff and it's damage to the environment. It too will run out. These are resources that have taken millions of years to produce and we're using them up. It's like living off a credit card and the payment's going to come due. Water you know about. Uh, it's uh, basically uneven, but it's all over the world. North China, which grows grain, doesn't have water. South China has lots of water. That's why they're building a canal to the north. Some people say water is going to be the, uh, the oil of the future, I mean, in terms of problems. This is hard to read, but if you look at the blue, that's the fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, or shown here, predicted to run out around 2050, when a third of the land, plant, and animal species are extinct due to climate change. Uh, you can see the metals, aluminum runs the longest, copper and, 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 and indium, and those metals are very short-lived. It's costing so much to get them out now that it's uh, not economically feasible. And we in the U.S., as you can see here, uh, thank goodness they call it North America, uh, we use something like five times our global share of, uh, of the globe. The available capacity is 1.8 global hectares per person. Uh, the bottom line is population, so you can see that it's not a problem, it's a problem of the developed world and, and the lifestyle that we lead, not population numbers. This one uh, shows you uh, the energy consumption uh, based on uh, relative to urban density with Hong Kong where you can get anywhere from anywhere to anywhere easily with, with no sort of zero change when you go from one means to the other. All the world's most beautiful cities live mostly below that line. Something happens here. Can you hear me? Oh, I have to be over here. I guess. Uh, and also, the, it's an interesting anecdotal thing that more pedestrians are killed in those top uh, towns, Houston, Phoenix, and so on, than any other kind of uh, city, primarily, primarily because there's no place to walk. That's what we use. Fossil fuels, petroleum, natural gas, coal, uh, which what adds up to something like three quarters of it. Renewable energy, if you eliminate uh, Hi, uh, biofuels and wood is really quite small of the total process. Those are the things that make the problem. Scientists will tell you that if you stop using fossil fuels tomorrow, which obviously is silly, it would take the earth a thousand years to get back into equilibrium because we've passed the tipping point. Al Gore helped uh, raise our awareness of this stuff. And if you ask, I don't want this to come back at me, but if you ask the design faculty at MIT, how many parts per million of carbon are there in the atmosphere? I don't believe there's a single person that can tell you. Maybe one. And it's above 400 now. The tipping point, according to James Hansen, the NASA uh, scientist, uh, originally said it would take, it, it had to be 350 particles per
per million in order to maintain a two, two, maintain a two degree centigrade temperature. He now says that it should be more like 250. So we're way past the tipping point, and it keeps going even if you stop using fossil fuels. By the time you get to five degrees centigrade increase, you start getting extinction, not only of species, but of people. Not to mention that when the globe warms, as an average, it's going to warm more around the meridional areas. And in fact, there are people who project that it, within the next few years, parts of the equatorial areas are going to be uninhabitable most of the year. So the migrations that we're looking at now are going to be a drop in the bucket compared to what might happen uh, within 10 to 20 years. So that lifestyle, urban, suburban, and rural, is a crucial thing because if you look at the U.S., it's tricky because what are the definitions of urban? If you look and you get a metropolitan area, and it says that there are whatever, 50% or 70% of the people that live in that area. They're not living in an urban area, they're living in a metropolitan area. So the urban population of the U.S. is about 32%. The suburban area is about, the suburban population is about 52%. Even though now the demographics are such that only 24% of households now are married couples with children and fewer than the 30% that are essentially single parent households. It used to be much higher than that. And the house that's in that picture was about 1,000 square feet. The average suburban home now is 2,500 square feet. So as the demographics have gotten smaller, the houses have gotten bigger, and the idea of drive until you can afford it, which has promoted expansion forever out from the centers of cities, uh, is, part of the bubble that burst in 2008. And if you read the bottom, it's a significant majority of minorities also live in suburbs now, over 50%. If you look at how we live, this is from Vishan Sakrabarti's book, uh, A Nation of Cities. Uh, there are only 4% of the people that live units uh, in 30 habitations of 30 units per acre uh, or more. Detached houses account for 61% of the population. There it is. We got lots of stuff. You know, we got boats, we got kids, we got dogs. Do you know that the toxins that are washed into the soil from rainwater? are greater, significantly greater in the suburbs than they are in the inner cities and the inner suburbs. Uh, this is what makes America great, right? Conquering the desert, uh, one family houses, can't walk. Do you know what a walk score is? How many of you students know what a walk score is? you all need to learn what a walk score is. Because it's a fundamental principle. Modernist planning believed in blanket monofunctional zoning. Multifunctional zoning produces walk scores in the 90s. That is to say you can walk for five or 10 minutes and get most of what you need. Here you have to drive everywhere. This is my favorite. Stunning, huh? What kind of crazy world is it that we live in? So there you go. There's Manhattan, and there's Middlebury, Vermont, where we did a, a sustainable master plan. Vermont, those of you that got the readings know that uh, Vermont is normally referred to as the green state, and it was voted um, I don't know, the most green state or something very high up the list. In actual fact, it's the fourth worst state for environmental concerns, for energy use and everything else. They use more water per person than New Yorkers. They use more than three and a half times as much gasoline driving around because it's not dense enough. 
They use one and a quarter as much time as electricity, generate more solid waste, and have a larger carbon footprint than Manhattanites do. And yes, there is the heat island effect, but there are all kinds of studies about how to ameliorate that. So here you go. Look at the difference between suburban single family detached living on the very left hand column and the three urban conditions on the right hand side. Uh, actually, we, we live in this one, I would say. But it's scandalous. We have 5% of the world's population and we use something like 25 to 30% of the world's petroleum. And we use 75% of that for running around, not for building hospital equipment, not for building computers and things like that, but for running around. It's the way we live. So what are architects doing? Well, they're doing crap like this. <laughs> Lee Hodgson, who some of you know, this thing here reminds me of it. He used to say, God, man, these architects, they're like two-year-olds. They crap on the floor and then say, Mommy, Mommy, look what I made. <laughs> this is a problem, you know? It's a real problem. And some of these are good architects, some are not good architects. Look at this. This is brilliant. Glass buildings in the desert, where it's uh, 95 degrees or more every day of the year. What lunacy. And the people that have lived here will tell you what it's like, that you can't get there from here. You can't walk anywhere. You have to get in your car and drive all around, all over the place. So this is Doug Kelbaugh's drawing of another idea, a conceptual idea. It looks like, a bit like Evan, uh, a kind of casual version of Ebenezer Howard's uh, Garden City diagram. But it's that you get a city of compact neighborhoods and then a series of smaller uh, villages or towns around it with open landscape as opposed to suburban sprawl as we know it. And so the choice is really, uh, this, is, this is in China, not in Texas. I don't know where that is. Uh, even without the wine, Bordeaux is an incredible place. And I confess that I like cities. I hate to go out to places where there's dirt. Uh, but we're going to be forced to, you guys are going to be forced to completely rethink the way you design and the way we inhabit things. And nobody knows the answer, but I think you need to engage with the issues and fairly straightforwardly. You need to learn your craft and make sexy designs, but you need to have them applicable to a kind of fundamental human condition. Otherwise, the earth is going to take care of the problem and us. So there are only two solutions, as far as I can see, and they're equally valid, maybe. One is to have a party, like my cousins in Texas. They drive a Cadillac Escalade. What do they care? I mean, they're going to die within 10 years, so it doesn't matter. Uh, well, they're old, right? They're like Art McDonald here. <laughs> or you can say, I, I got to think practically and make a plan for the future, not based on expediency of the moment, but leapfrogging over it and asking what, is, what are likely to be the issues 50 years from now, and how can I do things that don't preclude getting there? Because that's what expediency precludes that. You have to think long range and then develop a strategy for next Monday morning. Anyway, that's my evangelical thing for today.
this one. I don't have a thing. Should I put this on? Yeah, you should. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Michael. That was good inquiry. Uh, our second speaker, Roger Sherman here. Some of you, I hope most of you, went to his lecture last time, which was excellent. Um, I recently learned that he was actually a student of our first speaker, though. No? That's what you're doing. You're just friends. Okay. <laughs> um, Roger's been practicing since the 90s in Los Angeles, uh, originally uh, on his own in RSA UD, which is Roger Sherman Architecture and Urban Design. Uh, I think you're still involved with that, right? Somehow. No, Gensler now. Now just Gensler, okay. Uh, he, so he's a senior architect there. Um, he's currently a visiting critic here, as I said before. Um, and most importantly for today's discussion, uh, as well as designing a series of projects in less dense physical, less physically dense cities like Los Angeles, he's the author of three books of architecture on the city, in particular in what I would call exurban regions uh, like LA. The books are Fast Forward Urbanism, Reconnecting Architecture in the City, um, L.A. Under the Influence, The Hidden Logic of Urban uh, Property, and Re-American Dream, Six New Housing Prototypes for Los Angeles. I suspect he'll be at least indirectly uh, referring to the ideas in these books and the various strategies that he uses, and, and perhaps talking about what I, if you've read the German uh, architect and urbanist, uh, Thomas Severs, uh, the sense of creating publicness in less dense environments, uh, and other kinds of densities as well. Uh, for instance, functional density, social density, and things like that. Things that are in the spread out context, but are very difficult to try and find and organize. So, ladies and gentlemen, please help me introduce Roger Thurman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, I, I think we need to click oh, yeah. on this, whatever, which one yeah, we can you do want. The PowerPoint. I want to do the PowerPoint? Yeah. Hopefully it will work. It will. And yeah. I have to admit, in, in the very long period of time um, that it's been uh, since I've known Mike, uh, though I saw him for the first time rather recently, um, I've forgotten what a hard act he is to follow. Um, but I also want to say to all of you, it's, it's kind of a little bit of a poignant moment for me because um, we, we do go back to uh, a very long time. And uh, I think my perspective on architecture was, uh, you know, really inalterably sort of set largely from an exposure to Mike. And I think that sometimes you don't really realize the extent of that influence till many years down the line. One of the, one of the things that I, I have to say, which I, I didn't realize the magnitude of the, at the time, was that I just assumed as a result of my experience uh, through, the, through, the, through his pedagogy that architects were just interested in cities. That's part of what architects did. Um, but since then, I realized that's really not the case, unfortunately, in many um, and, and I don't know if that's been really a cultural shift away or that was the particularity of the time that we were in or the fact that we, the place that we happen to be together. Um, but it really changed and really formed my perspective. It didn't change it. I just, it just became built into my DNA as an architect. I, I wasn't per se uh, persuaded to go into, to believe that planning was the answer to those things. I really believed as I believe today and you'll see in what I'm showing you that that it's an architectural problem. And I actually believe today um, that it's, it's again, and I talked about this a little bit or at least implied it last night, that it's increasingly at the architectural scale that I believe that urban, urban problems can be solved, particularly um, in North America, I think. I mean, we may, we may at this point have, Mike and I may have, maybe this is a point of discussion that we'll have afterward. But, um, but I think that uh, this issue of scalability is, as you know, in many other areas of invention and innovation today, particularly in technology, 
has become king. And I think to the extent that we can solve problems through innovation at an architectural scale, but find that there's actually replicability in the solutions, is fundamental to the way of thinking about how to solve problems necessarily than in very large planning projects. Those may work in China, although they, they obviously have a, a, another side if they fail. Um, but at any rate, uh, it was just something that I felt, um, you know, that uh, was important to me to mention in this, and it was really a pleasure and a privilege to be able to, to kind of reconnect and have an opportunity to do so uh, tonight. So um, my, uh, as opposed to Mike's very sort of high-level view, and uh, kind of a considerable amount of research into the problem of density. I would say that I'm a little bit, I think what I'm gonna show you today is a little bit, I'm a little bit more like an anteater, where I kind of scour the floors of the city and I pick up stuff, and then I kind of construct a theory as I am very pragmatically oriented. I construct my theories not on the basis of ideology, but observation. And then solutions begin to emerge um, that aren't necessarily a constructive of a larger worldview per se that I'm trying to say, but just simply one problem at a time, um, which isn't to say that they're absent of ideas, but I think you'll see more what I, uh, what I mean as we go along. But at any rate, um, what I really want to talk about is what I, my, my discoveries, shall we say, just in a, a life of living in Los Angeles almost, almost 30 years and how the interests that, uh, you know, that I shared with Mike at one time became kind of translated into a, a kind of discovery about how to contend with the problems that happen to be in where I, around me, let's put it that way. So I've titled the, this talk, which I put together very quickly, but intuitively, Uneven, Virtual, and Empty, the Paradox of Density in Its Varied Forms. And it, it, it indeed is a paradox, because every time I deal with issues of density, I deal with the paradox of people's resistance to it. And so all of the work that I'm going to show and the things that I'm going to talk about are, the, are, are ones that put me in the position and architects in the position of having to navigate between the desire to densify and the resistance to it in the forms as we know it called nimbyism. And whether or not in a way you can, uh, let's say, slip a mickey, find ways of slipping the public a mickey or in, for dogs, you know, putting the pill in the peanut butter, getting it to actually go down in a way that actually has the, has the unexpected benefit of forcing innovation and the develop of new typologies and strategies of density um, than I might have otherwise expected or thought of um, in the same way, in, in, by contrast to say many of my colleagues um, in the urban design division of Gensler who kind of have a muscle memory way of approaching how you, how you solve these things. So I'm not making any pretenses about whether the things I'm going to show you will work in China or Singapore or, you know, or Hamburg or wherever. It's just a matter, it's a kind of a homegrown approach to thinking about some of these problems. Um, so I'm showing you a little bit about this. I'm going to deal with these in order, the unevenness, the virtuality, and then the, and then the, um, the emptiness. Both of, all three of those, by the way, refer to the density, uneven density, virtual density, and um, empty density. Even emptiness has density, as I'll argue. So this, this is the map of Los Angeles, which I'm simply showing to you as if to say that um, density never, it just simply doesn't come in even forms anymore. If I were to show you, if I were to show you a map of, of Europe, you might find that this would be a lot more evened out in places, though there would still be some unevenness. But I think that the paradigm that I've grown, you know, I've grown up with as a professional has been largely one of unevenness. And that this translates both to incoming inequalities and also uh, differences of opinion about where one wants to live. The kind of ambiances and, and environments that we genuinely choose to live in. So if you, uh, following on my talk last night, if you ask people in Los Angeles where do they live, they don't say I live in Los Angeles. In other words, if you're in New York and you come across somebody, They'll say, I live in Silver Lake, or I live in Santa Monica, or I live in K-Town. And those are, those are referring to the fact that we, everything is local now. It's like, I watch cable channels, I don't watch network TV. I, I identify with the place I am, and part of the character of that place is the density, makeup. So one of the things that, uh, that I think is, is interesting about this, that, we, that I observed, this is what the studio that I'm offering here uh, this semester is about, 
is that as Los Angeles began to grow, something very funny happened, which is that uh, as it grew, it actually developed pockets within itself, pockets of resistance in which people began to feel as though the uneven spread of suburbia for them um, no, no longer felt proprietary enough. In other words, they didn't have a sense of belonging to their tribe. And so geographically, there were holes that I, I refer to as ozones or overlay zones that were created, whether it's an Orthodox Jewish community or a, or a community of historic preservationists who live in an area because of those houses and so on. And that there's a, and, and, and what I'm showing you this as is kind of a CAT scan, if you will, that explains the unevenness, the desire that people have to actually congregate around people who have different visions of the lifestyle that is connected to choices about density. That they want density four ways or 16 ways. Um, they don't, and so, and those are very much, that's kind of, so I don't think, I'm trying to kind of allude to the idea, I don't think this is about a, a false dichotomy between sprawl and, and Manhattanism, but rather between uh, a refinement of various innovations in terms of how you fit a certain number of people in a, in a certain kind of uh, pattern or invention of distribution. So to my point, this, and this is not an exaggeration, all of the people who live in places like this, which is, you know, many, many of the people in Los Angeles, they like going here on Friday night. And by the way, this is not downtown. This is a Rick Caruso fake village um, that's one of the most popular retail destinations in all of Los Angeles called The Grove. Uh, it's hugely popular so that they can have their three minutes, uh, sorry, their three hours of urban experience and then they'll drive back. And this is alluding to kind of what Mike is talking about. But at the same time, the driving, what's driving this is also not just the car, it's a social desire to put together, to use the car as an aleatory vehicle for patching together a sampling of densities. Now, I don't really view that, um, I've, I've said that quite purposely as not a statement of belief or ideology, but simply a statement of fact. That's just the way that things work right now. One of the things that I, my, my perspective is, is really shaped by living in Los Angeles is that you cannot talk about real estate development or density or the form of the city without thinking about property. Because everything in Los Angeles is driven by property. And the entitlement of property to be able to do different things with your property and to actually pack it, get the most value you possibly can out of your property. But that can mean different things to different people. So this is a case, for instance, where occasionally those get exposed, where you will see a, a veterinary clinic like this that is about seven or eight feet wide. How's that, Mike? Pretty good, right? Um, right sandwiched by two huge surface parking lots because the desires of those three property owners are different. They, have, they control three different properties. So the idea that you could actually think of something at an urban design scale is difficult in places like Los Angeles where it's like herding cats to get people to try to cooperate with one another. Um, at the same time, of course, this is why we all like this, right? It's, or I'm thinking most of you are kind of thinking this is pretty cool. It's interesting because of the fact that density in a way is created in the smallest way. In other words, it doesn't create, it, it, it's a different idea. It's a, there's an aesthetic of density which does not necessarily have to do with its extensiveness, but rather its intensiveness, right? So it can even happen on an individual lot, even if this was just by circumstance or accident. This property I wanna talk about a little bit because it really talks to the point, of, it's in the LA the, under the influence um, thing, which is that this is, this is density LA style. In other words, the, the ingredients that constitute the density are not always necessarily buildings. This person, as you'll see in a set of diagrams, extracts a tremendous amount of income from his property. And that's more income than if those buildings went all the way up to the sidewalk. Why? Because you'll see that the amount of income that's extracted from the air rights that are given over to this billboard far exceeds the amount that they would get from apartments going to the curb. And the same with the palm reader who's out in front. They can charge more for the retail rents, and of course, it doesn't hurt to be able to park your car there 
kind of, kind of as well. So over the course of a series of four, four periods of time, this person went from having one property, and this is something that is uniquely allowed by American property law, to subdivide your property, regardless of your ownership of the land, into different rights that can be sold to different people for different purposes. This is not about Thomas Jefferson, this is about John Locke, about property as commodity. So, so the property is divided into two, so it's worth now more money than it was. The dollar sign gets larger. Um, at, at, in, 19, in 1962, it gets the, the other property gets divided again. The, the money gets even larger. We add the palm reader. The, uh, this, the, the, the acoustical thing is actually referenced by building two apartment buildings within the lot itself. And then by the time 1968 comes along, the billboard is being added. And each, the addition of each interest to, um, into that property raises the income of the overall owner so that they, it gets bigger and bigger, right? Which is, which is a means basically of explaining how that phenomenon occurs. So this is another way of looking at it. These are the maps that basically show, you see that little property right there? So first it looks like this. You can see that things keep getting added incrementally over time. This is blown up with the addition of each successful thing. And here again, you can see that the density increases, but the property is made larger, uh, more as a proportion of the amount of income, its value, how much it's now worth. So value has not to just do with the rise in the real estate market over time. Of course, we know that. It has to do with extracting as much value as you possibly can out of its use. That, to me, is a form of density. It's not the type that we learn as architects, but it's a kind of organic form that's extrapolated from the city. So this is the way that that looks, and what we've done to make it more interesting, the kind of game, is I, I'm showing you the actual relative value of each of those pieces. So the palm reader is actually worth more in the rents than the apartment building. And that's the real size, if you were to adjust it for income, of the stanchion that holds up the billboard. So what, it, what begins to happen in that way is that these various interventions begin to kind of climb over and entangle with one another in strange ways, because obviously it's weird. You have to walk around the palm reader to get to your apartment. And you know the, um, there are many other examples that I can give you about how the billboard it gets, provides a sunshade for the front units of the apartment building, and so on and so forth. There's a similar example for the PDC. I think you can see the parallel where um, this this, uh, a kind of more characteristic suburban fabric was cleared in order to make, make room for this giant behemoth of a building, which by, by the way, I like very much, the blue whale. Um, but there's a reason I'm showing this in black and white. But something very curious happened, which is actually that in the course of aggregating the properties, that means the developer going around and trying to buy out everybody so that they could build it. Guess what, of course, of course, there were two old ladies who wouldn't, who wouldn't sell. And so the PDC, it was like itching us, you know, like it, it was like a boil that you couldn't get rid of. They tried to, to conceal it, and in the course of doing so, they planted ficus trees around it, which then grew to be huge. And so, so the little hut that was there that they couldn't stand, that Caesar Pelli couldn't, couldn't stand, actually became something that really served, in my mind, beneficially as a kind of counterpoint to, uh, to the size of the old building, a kind of sense of archaeology of the city where you have this little old two ladies with their plating shop that had a driveway cutting into the middle of Caesar Pelli's terrace steps. And my argument is really that this is also a form of density. I don't say this big thing that's very dense is better than this little thing, which is suburban. I said that these two things actually together make a more vibrant space than the, than the PDC would have alone with its 60s plaza or 70s plaza because of the fact that you understand something transparently about the city and, it, and the growth in real estate value and the, and the change of interest made more transparent. So these are some different views, a section at the bottom, just showing the process by which this displacement occurred from all these little things to keeping one one place, the growth of this, and how they tried to make it go away from their perspective by making the trees appear to camouflage it. Again, another project, I'm going to go very quickly. 
Um, but this is a place called Curly's Cafe, which is right here, which is an old uh, coffee house, and there are oil derricks, which are in this area. Why? Because the oil derricks were here first, but there's a whole lot of land that was, that was useful for other purposes once people began to move into the area. So you have Curly's Cafe with the oil derrick that's immediate, that are in the parking lot that you have to kind of drive around with the bank behind. And this, this multi, multiple exchange diagram shows all of the interests that are involved. So now, as you've seen, I've been moving into density as more of a virtual phenomenon, meaning it may not look dense, but it's very dense, believe me. There are many, many people at play fighting tooth and nail, even in a, uh, in a uh, presumably uh, or ostensibly kind of non-dense sort of environment. But there are also very productive synergies and interesting things that happen, like the fact that the interior is themed around the, 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 um, the oil rigs that are out in the parking lot that, because they become part of the identity now that, with which the, the cafe is associated. And people have landmarked, have viewed this cafe as a cultural and local landmark due to the fact that it has these oil rigs in front. And then there are interesting things that go on. There is a hedge that was built between the two sites and Curly's actually does its banking at this bank that's on the next lot. So they cut a little pass through the hedge called Turner's Pass. And uh, they, they had to design the parking lot so that the rigs that would come through to, to load up on the oil could clear around where all the parking was and so on. So there's a kind of, this is where the money is taken in a bag over to the bank after the cash register fills up. So what I'm suggesting, these are more complex diagrams. Those are showing the oil fields that lie underneath. I think it's interesting that Mike's talking about oil because this is some very different manifestation of how that actually literally surfaces is basically that, um, that these things actually can be, uh, I think, visually productive because there's a degree of interaction that actually is going on. These are not things that are statically necessarily sitting next to each other. This is actually a bank parking lot, which has a cross. The bank tried to buy, that's uh, a long story, but the bank needed to expand its parking and the homeowner wouldn't sit, wouldn't sell to them next door, but the homeowner beyond, uh, on the other side of that homeowner would. So they got an easement through, that, through, the, through the first person's lot in order to get over to the second. Um, and then they finally bought it. So there are these funny little squiggles that cross through the site one pro I just want to, so I'm going to show you, I think, two projects um, just at the end about this. One was from the RE American Dream project, which really shows this, many of the processes that I'm outlining here. This shows about, in a typical tract within Los Angeles, the process of densification and how we worked through this idea of how you, how you develop the idea of intensifying, looking at density through the intensification of income and microdevelopment. Here, one, in, in, in 1850, there was a house that sits on a very typical large tract of land. By 1900, that person has sold off much of the land for, for subdivision development. Now, now has a size this, of this parcel. At that point, the, the next generation of the family sells off much, most of that land to arrive at the 50 by 150 lot that is typical of LA today. The project that I'm going to just show you a little snippet of is really beginning to look at how one could take that same process and find an escape velocity by slingshotting that same trajectory into the future in order to see whether even the 50 by 150 lot uh, could be divided one more time. So the proposal was, and the proposition is that you take the typical setbacks, you subdivide the property into two perfectly nice properties that are, are half that, which are only 3,600 square feet. And with that, you get two for one, and instead of the houses having a kind of stylistic difference, it's actually the typology of their courtyards that begins to supplant the idea of character and identity differentiation. But this is a slipping, it's a kind of slipping a Mickey kind of strategy in that the outward appearance of the, tr of, of, the, of the real estate development does not change all that much because the scale and dedication to separateness remains preserved. This is the driveway that comes in, shared but with a right hand and a left hand by two properties. So this is one half of this is one property and you can get back to the rear one. So what we were seeking to do was to preserve the ability 
to have access to all of the amenities that people choose to live in suburbia to retain, but to see whether we could achieve twice the density of, um, by still allowing them to have the car, maybe it's an electric car, all this was before electric cars, uh, maybe, you know, still have the antenna, still have the, you know, the barbecue outside, all of the things that cause them to be there without necessarily going, switching to a new gear and to an entirely new typology, which actually in many ways has benefits in that these are communities of people who live in places and if their choice has to be to move to a bigger house uh, or, a, a, or there are people of a certain income level who are precluded from living in suburbia, this would enable them to actually come here and afford a lot. So there's a kind of politic that goes with it. This is a kind of figure ground from the existing on the left to what this might produce on the right. And the way that those kinds of separations are achieved by simply formalizing the idea of the garden walls and hedges that already informally differentiate properties from one another. Uh, these are, it's here to simply show that these, this, this strategy could exist and coexist with, uh, with, the common, with the common typologies that exist in LA today. What's interesting about the project um, in retrospect is the fact that since then, the city has enacted, though through in, um, after, after many, many people had, um, had started per, uh, uh, working through the informal process of developing granny flats within their homes to actually to do exactly what we're proposing, which is to provide, to provide accommodation for a second generation of their own family, first starting by living in the garage or doing an addition to the garage and so on, so that in fact, things tend to look the same, but actually in the back where you can't see it, or inside of the garage, more population, more density is developing. Last, uh, the last project I want to show you is the empty is about empty density. It's about the idea that this paradox that I've talked about, which is the, the the dedication to the idea of a certain percentage, a kind of dedication to the preservation of open space and the importance of that, might commingle at at the same time or not be exclusive from the idea of de density. So. Uh, I, I showed this last night. I'm going to show you just a few images of it again so, I'm, so as not to repeat myself. But it's really to look at whether or not that paradox can be, can be explored through the conflation of what are, what are right now thought of as being oppositional approaches, which is open space and infill. Why can't we have both? So whereas in one type of park, as in MacArthur Park that I showed you last night, you can only do six things. As I mentioned before last night, urban recreation is really taking forms that don't involve lawns and trees anywhere kids want to do. And a lot of the construction of parks, 90% of parks today are, are actually skate parks. People are looking at new forms of urban recreation. They begin to suggest new typologies that it can occur under smaller formats. And uh, the kind of pro forma that we developed was such that a park could have potentially a floor area, the idea of a floor area ratio, which parks are assumed not to have because they're simply the whatever land you've bought, <clears throat> and that the utilization and the costs and the amount of um, and the amount of activities that you can have and even the sources of funding all increase in value. Actually, the land utilization decreases, but everything else increases to the public benefit in a in a kind of space-starved city. Um, so that actually, in a way, you can produce density counterintuitively. You can produce density through open space rather than erode it. And moreover, you can find that parks, that sites that you would never have thought of as being made makeable into a park, suddenly become on the radar as being things which are prospects for doing that and at the same time achieve the densification of the city. This is uh, the er very early Frank Gehry uh, kind of experiment that I showed you last night. And these are some of those pictures. I think that's, yeah, I think that's, this is it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Roland. Thank 
invent a density strategy, an idea of something that apparently appears to be maybe the opposite or something, something different. So. I thought about a couple of things when you were presenting the same thing with multiple divisions in the courtyard houses. Uh, one of them was about the difference between urban and city and other terms. But it used to be that city, the word city and urban were synonymous with each other. Mm -hmm. They are not now. Mm -hmm. Technically, is a city by population standards, which is what most of the <coughs> use uh, as a definition, but it's not urban. On the other hand, uh, Cabo San Lucas in Mexico, which is a little town that has mostly one story buildings and two story buildings, is in fact completely urban. Because buildings touch each other, the continuity of the and so on. And the other thing was the process of transformation. Uh, years ago, uh, we did a joint studio with the G at uh, GC, boy, that's up for it, so, uh, <coughs> at MIT. Uh, <laughs> it was this <laughs> <year's from> us, <laughs> at, at MIT, the joint studio between uh, us and the University of Miami. And one of the students, well, what hit the pause button, when, when there was a great influx of Cubans in Miami. They basically uh, went into a suburban area, mm -hmm. and because of their culture, they sort of defied all odds and turned it into a kind of urban life place. Uh, and so the student, and, and the population in Miami is supposed to increase drastically and not double by 2050, mostly Hispanic, mostly low income. And so the student from the university, uh, from MIT, uh, doesn't matter, developed a strategy for building in the community, in the backyards of these suburban houses like that project that you showed, mm -hmm. and showed it through a process of three or four steps, where it gradually became genuinely urban, which they were doing anyway. They didn't, so there was, there were no, no buildings, no cafes, but they made this thing culturally on the street. It was fantastic. And so the idea of urbanity is, I think, uh, was one of the really intriguing things about that project. The other aspect of it, though, that makes things urban is that you have mixed use. It is not uh, functionally, uh, monofunctional zones, but we would in fact have a mix of things which was lively. I have big arguments with Steve Peterson about this. Because he's only interested in the form of the thing. But in fact, what you, you can't just have the form, you need the kind of uh, cultural and, and uh, functional aspect of oh, the multi functional yeah. thing. The problem is, in the long run, though, I think you, uh, we don't need to worry too much about the cities because their value almost everywhere now, people thought they were dying in the 1970s. Now, you, you, a lot of people can't afford to live in the city. So, and, and if you read something like Lee Gallagher's book, The End of the Suburbs, where the bust happened in 2008, and a lot of these places are out in the way out of the suburbs. And developers now are not doing that stuff, they're doing more infill projects. So there's a whole range of potential, I think, around the dense cores of cities, pockets of things where, in fact, density, increased density can happen and where walkable communities can happen. Um, it's, um, I think it's going to be forced on us. And the U.S. population, by the way, is supposed to increase by, the numbers differ slightly, but between 100 million and 115 million people by 2050. Where are they going to go? They're not going to keep going out further and further. So there's going to be some kind of radical change in things. And when uh, the big problem, of course, you mentioned about politics, there's no government in the world today that can deal with the problem. You watch 
lots of Democratic Republican arguments going on, uh, and you realize <laughs> we're we're in for it. Even kind of which could deal with it, can't deal with it for other reasons. So there's a huge political problem, and there will be a, a big cultural issue as well. It goes along with all this stuff. Well, I think I think some of what you're pointing out, I think what what it brings to mind. To me, that's always been really interesting, and I maybe I realized I should have probably made mention of it too. Is that uh, this approach to density, for for the most part, when you hear it being dealt with by 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 planners and uh, and the like, it's it's suggested as if all the solutions that are that they come up with uh, that are come up with are for the most part top down. That's why the predominant as soon as you talk about density in Los Angeles, and I have to do a conference actually, it's funny, in a, like two weeks on this in Los Angeles, it automatically goes to transit-oriented districts because we're building a new, you know, new uh, transit system. And that's great. Let's build more density around each transit station. But as we know, you know, the, the walkable, the metric of that for them to work is a quarter mile or half mile at best. It's not, you know, it's a lot of density right in one place, but if you look at it across the spectrum of what's needed, citywide, it's like a pimple on the ass of an elephant. It's, it's not much. And nobody wants to attack the bigger problem, which is the idea of how to actually work through other methods to figure out which will have to be bottom up because they, because, of, because people will just uh, ring the neck of whatever politician wants to raise it of all of that land that occurs that's R1 zoning. But I find um, it's not so dangerous. It's actually the part that interests me the most because to get to your point about Miami and that case study, um, the discussion of density in the case of the of bottom up has less to do with using the tool of the envelope or FAR or unit, unit uh, or the number of units and has more to do with thinking through what I call protocols. It's like cancer treatment, where you say, what is it that I can do to provide incentives? What are the forces out there that, could I, that I could harness to make this area densify so that people actually want to densify? Like, for instance, the fact that property values are so high that their members of their own family can't even live decently. So now people are willing to say, I'm going to put my grandparents up on my property. They're going to share a part of my house and my kids can't afford a place to live. So can there be loopholes? And I think that's maybe probably what would happen in the case of Miami. You find loopholes that exist by working in the gaps in the code to figure out how, how, to, call, how to enable people to actually make changes, um, incremental changes to that suburban fabric, which even if you were to add 50% of it would literally be uh, many times, add many times more square footage than all of the transit-oriented districts you could possibly add. I'm not saying that those TIDs are not a solution. I'm just saying that in the end, they're, they're limited in terms of, it, of solving the, the larger problem, and they only, they only are going to be good for certain types of people who are you know, maybe right out of school or lower income or something. Well, I can't help but think, what will we do when we can't drive fossil fuel cars? And you can say, oh, well, we'll invent something. Right? That's the usual thing. We call that waiting for Santa Claus, uh, who's going to come and give us a gift and solve our problem. That's not going to happen. There's no indication that it's going to happen. And it's worth, I think, speculating about it. Uh, this is not a bottom-up, top-down argument, but uh, there are probably going to be issues that mercifully I won't have to deal with. Uh, these guys will. Uh, when that stuff starts to happen, or when, it's, when it gets so, when the oil gets so expensive, the gas is so expensive that only a few people can afford it. You're going to get massive kind of social comfort. Uh, income inequity today is going to become a kind of monstrous thing when you connect to the, to the actual world. Uh, and I think you, need, you probably need, if you're going to be an architect and be working in this kind of environment, you need a multiplicity of ways to do it. 
some place like Manhattan is, is basically not a problem. The land values are so high that it has to be uh, dense and therefore ecologically efficient uh, on a per capita basis. But there are huge parts of the U.S. and other parts of the world that are not like that. And, um, and unfortunately, people are not going to hear the point you made about, um, well, not in my backyard, basically having an emergency density. We're right now urban design consultants in Cambridge for uh, the largest piece of property that's left to, to be developed. It has the Volpe Center, which is a transportation center on the site right now. And, and in order to redevelop it, the developer has to buy, buy them a brand new building. $400 million expensive. <coughs> but we know that what the, what the, we're, we're having meetings with the neighborhood committees and so forth, but what they want is they want a big park, they want a fair amount of housing, uh, they want not density, and of course density is the only thing that's going to make it, make it happen. So it's not just in kind of uh, Los Angeles neighborhoods, but it's in already in more, more dense neighborhoods, and you have to deal with it. Um, isn't there a danger of uh, simplifying in a way the equation? Uh, a, because, for instance, China uh, has gone through the process where 500 million people have moved through the country, from the country <coughs> to the cities. Like, I mean, if you look at the strategy of the Chinese government, they are actually buying all the natural resources, both in Latin America and in Africa. In a way, recognizing that the issue of density can be misconstrued as simply relational between space and people, but the actual sheer size of the human population and the pressure on human resources makes for very important political and military decisions that operate on that. I think that, you know, A, that has one, one, one question. The second is that there are very different political systems in which we as architects operate, you know, and the kind of role that we play whether it's in China, whether it's in, in Europe, in Latin America, or the States. And for me, you know, just this is not to, uh, not to make an argument one way or the other, but I'm interested in, you, in your discourse where you're reclaiming for design a role in that, in that sort of huge thing of recognizing you know, the limitations of what architecture can do and how you can insert yourself in a certain position. Right? I think your, your, uh, your presentation was really scary. <laughs> And I think you're right to be scared, not only for what you said, but also what, for many other things. Uh, what would, I think what would be useful to, to try to frame the question is how, within the disciplinary field of architecture, I mean, the practice of the profession, you know, what kind of architects you do and how do we insert ourselves into that, into that problematic? Because obviously, it's not all architects. Superblock 3,000 feet superblock. You put the whole central Florence into one of these blocks with buildings all going in the same direction. Huge uh, highways uh, around the, the blocks going every direction. Now there's a tendency, not only here, but in China, to have a different planning model. To have smaller blocks, smaller streets, and there are technical ways uh, to do this that make a more uh, joyous environment to begin with that are more urban and also conserve resources. But unless my cousins are going to drive their Escalon, no matter what I say to them, I don't say anything. Yeah. But, 
potential for massive migrations north and south, right? The military apparently has quasi-secret committees because they're going to be responsible for dealing with the issue physically, morally, ethically, and everything else. So the, you, you could be very well facing a kind of cultural problem or a migrational problem and therefore political and physical problem that makes the current circumstance seem trivial, you know. Uh, but it's going to be outside forces or maybe the economy is changing. The economy is already changing the, those far outer suburbs. Uh, and going like this, I mean in yeah. U Utah right. and wherever it is, uh, all over, because they're, they're shrinking. People right. are coming back to more uh, urban conditions. But the economy, ecology, those are things outside of us. We just need to know about things and be and have a uh, have a goal, you know, and a, and a way of getting somewhere that doesn't preclude other things, right? That doesn't add to the problem. It was interesting those diagrams you had of Los Angeles, and, well, several of them. The dates were 1906, 1956, and 2006. 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the way we live today has happened in the last, effectively, in the last 60 years, since about right. 1950. Since mm -hmm. Ray Kroc invented hamburgers in Los Angeles, right? And we started uh, having drive-in restaurants and motels and, and, you know, cheap land, cheap gas, use it up, you know, move out further and further. Uh, and that's changing. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a there's been a shift, and I, I mean, I you know, I don't want to wade into, you know, into the numbers at all, but I would imagine that there there are probably some significant changes having to do with with digital connectivity that may also be accounting for the fact that the number of trips people are taking is is reducing because they can accomplish certain things by ordering online. So you've now got. Um, it's called transportation as a service, where you're getting these services to get bring you stuff, as opposed to you, you know 100 people going out to, to do stuff in four places. You've got one service going to 100 people. Those are things that I don't know whether they may they they may implicate kinds of things a response in terms of the density, but I'm a bit more of this sort where I think that like you know the thing about saving energy if you use a different type of that you've got a million people using a light bulb that, that's more energy efficient, that's still a lot of energy. So to, I'm, I'm saying that only to say that um, simply by stopping the proliferation of sprawl may allow the improvement in te of technology and mobility to electricity and non emissions to take up some of the rest of the slack. And then we can concentrate in some ways of figuring out how to accommodate people who, in, in, different, in a different menu of ways, um, so that they don't, so that the, that demand for going out to the outer ring is further evaded. I mean, I wanted to say, I was just thinking about it, I had never thought about it before, that the wealthiest part of Santa Monica, where you have really like multi-million dollar homes, is in the northern part of Santa Monica, um, on, these, on these lots that are a little bit larger than normal, they're like 60 by 170. But these people who have a ton of money have built ginormous homes ginormous homes. And we can talk about the emissions within the home itself, but the thing that's really funny about it is that they're completely cheap by jowl. The density that is in that area is, is equal to um, probably almost any other place in the country except for Manhattan or urban cores. And yet these are the wealthiest people who, they want to live in that location and they want to have a house of a certain size. And they're going to have that even if the yard that they have is, is smaller on account of it. So that when you actually look at them, they're nothing but it's like a Potemkin village of facades that give them the satisfaction of feeling as though they're living in the suburbs. But if you were to look at the figure ground, you would, you would swear that it was someplace that was really urban. So it's very funny that way about, I'm interested in those weird paradoxes, like of appearance and weird, you know, how do you cut this cake? And what that actually reveals to you about people's perceptions of density. But the, I think what you what you have been saying I, to me the, the kind of interesting thing is that it's 
architecture as an embedded art, that it's embedded in uh, the fabric of human habitation to avoid, say, the city or an urban condition. And one of the biggest problems, I think, is that architects are being trained today as kind of uh, digital toy makers. Uh, or object makers. Well, that's what I mean, yeah. yeah. Like those uh, pictures that you saw. Boy, that's mm -hmm. cool, right? Look what I made, mommy, mommy, look what I made. And you've got to look at it how, whatever, however you see things as an embedded activity. You know, art, yes, but, but uh, urbanistically and socially biodegradable art. I mean, uh, my own concern in the discussion, in a way, is that it's the danger that we conflate the issue of density with environmental uh, agenda, and the environmental agenda somehow hijacks the entirety of the conversation, because I think in density there are many other conflicts that are embedded, that are equally real and equally challenges to our own discipline and our own intellectual agenda, not to go very far. You know, we might have a, a certain type of density in series, but it's a density that's incredibly segregated. We have in very clear strategies where you know, poor neighborhoods are, are cast away out of sight, out of, out of any participation in the city life. So there, there are other agendas that are embedded in the urban project that are basically about negotiation of conflict. It's about survival. It's survival not only in terms of environmentally sustainable, politically sustainable, socially sustainable. And those are issues that are as present, if not more present, and that affect also our ability to address the larger question. So for me, that there is, you know, as a moderator, I probably should be making this point, but I, I think it's from the market. But You're talking about, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I was going to open to oh. No, I was just going to make one last comment, which is, uh, it seems to me, if you were to be more, um, you know, totally crass about it, you would say that in the end, you can't, the market matters. Mm -hmm. And that environment, uh, you know, the, the developers, the people producing the density in Los Angeles, aren't trying to market their stuff by shaming people into living in denser circumstances because they're doing the right thing and living more densely. They're doing it through selling density as a lifestyle. You know, they have, they set up community organizations like with events in the courtyard, you know, pool parties and stuff for singles so that the court, you know, they, they don't think about it like, oh my God, I'm only living 25 feet away from my neighbor's window, right? But they see it as a way of building community for people who may, like singles who don't miss more moving to LA who don't have that. So I think it needs it needs enabling, but I think a lot of the enabling has to come through through lifestyle. But I, it also strikes me that a lot of these developers are doing it, even though the buildings are really banal that, they, that their architects have designed, and that maybe architects should be thinking more about how to channel the interest in the object, the styling of the object, to the styling of the, I don't want to say the space, but district, like that, that districts, that fabric can be iconic. Yeah. Not I just for pool parties in the courtyard. Yeah. I've really been into that. <laughs> They're not like what they used to be. The 50s <laughs> courtyards are still the best. I think we need to, I would really like to have a participation from the students and the faculty. The they doesn't have that many solid resources in our algebra. No. Raise your hand. You're going to be graded on your questions. You're going to be graded on your questions. No pressure, though. Hi. Um, thank you for that. It was super interesting to hear you. Um, I have a question. Like, in total global emissions, I think it's only 3% come from actual like, domestic emissions. And then only producing cement in the like, industry, it's more than, I think it's like 7%. So how do we, as architects, sort of also push for maybe greener materials and also think of energy efficiency and the embodied energy of what we produce and not only of sort of individual energy consumption after the architecture is done. Well, you have to think about it not just as building sustainable buildings. We need to build, I, I, I'm not sure I like the word sustainable, but everybody uses it. So you have to think about it as su sustainable in habitation. I mean, roughly it's one third, one third, one third. One third of energy goes to the buildings. This is not exactly true, but 8%, 8%. But uh, one third to transportation and one third to industry. 
transportation in the U.S. is a gigantic uh, user of uh, energy, fossil fuels, and that's what produces carbon. And so if you live closer, smaller, more compactly, and drive less, you've done an enormous amount. It is important to change the light bulb, but it's more important that the, the biggest gains are in the simplest ideas and the simplest strategies. students can go back and forth between New York and uh, uh, New York. And um, there's a funny aspect to this. I have to tell you this. That I thought the guy was crazy, the president of his university. And so when I went down for the first meeting, I was in the administrative building in the lobby, and this guy came in that was obviously the president. And I, we introduced ourselves, and I said, you must be completely, absolutely crazy to start an architecture school. Uh, you must have, you got to have buckets of money. you got to have trillions of money. It's a very expensive proposition. And we're kind of walking down this corridor and he says, uh, you know, a few years ago I met a regional party boss in China who was complaining about the quality of Soviet-style buildings and then we needed schools that taught students how to make a better building, etc. And he said he came over and we had a chat and we agreed to do these things. And by that point, we got down in front of a photograph. And I looked at this photograph and it was the president standing there with Xi Jinping, the president of China. <laughs> now, he said, I don't think we're going to have any trouble with money. <laughs> So it was a, a reverse thing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a tough one, but I'll just say, uh, is that okay? I, mean, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, uh, I've always been very intrigued with the way that the Verilaga Institute used to work uh, when, it was still, when it was still there. Michael knows it very well. Um, but uh, the reason was that um, the Verilaga kind of turns traditional education on its head in that instead of having a curriculum through which you, a straight curriculum which is determined by the faculty according to architecture's kind of canonic disciplines, whatever, tectonics and environment and so on, you might sort of uh, look at, start by, by figuring out whether the curriculum could be constructed on the basis of contemporary problems that exist in the world, and then you can, complex problems, that, that are given out as the centerpiece of the studio. And then, uh, basically, the design problem really, it is very much about interdisciplinary work, where issues of like how you work on the problem 
itself is respected as part of the design, as a design issue in and of itself, not just the what that you end up with. And that way, over the course of a period of time, it may not be that the entire curriculum is oriented that way, um, you know, people may look simply at parking and realize that parking is not, cannot be looked at just by itself. But that it does give you a wormhole portal into a set of other things that you didn't expect that it was connected to. And, and over a course of time, it not, not only provides, ensures that there's a degree of relevancy to the education as students leave, because these are problems that they would be coming out with in the world, um, but they understand something about the importance of the interconnectivity of the way that they, the design decisions that they make, not only about working in teams, but you know how things affect one another. I don't. I think things tend to be way too siloized. I think in most. And that's a model that they now. really took from the AA, which is yes. a unit system. I used to have a unit at the AA, and one of the things that I appreciate is the fact that the unit implies that the studio of the unit is a research unit, so that, as you say, if we identify a specific topic or territory that we want to explore, there are students of different levels, so they, there is a sort of uh, connectivity between them, and it creates a really exciting agenda, but also it was for a year. Right. Right. Well, right. I'm that's a, that we, I mean, maybe the change would be that we don't evaluate things on the basis of architectural aesthetics or correctness or whatever the valuation system might be, that we have, but that it's evaluated on consequence to the environment, cultural consequence, economic consequence. We, want, we don't have all of those, all that knowledge when we're sitting here evaluating projects, we evaluate it on something else. And maybe the evaluation system is completely different. And if that's true, then the start of the problem has to be different. The, the syllabus is different. Other questions? It's actually trying to do the opposite of that. It's saying that, that right now in, in Los Angeles, the only projects that can be done are so big because the problem is economy of scale, that it's so expensive to get something through the city of Los Angeles that you have to build a really big project in order for it to pencil out. So my, our, my proposal was exactly the opposite. It said you can, get, you can accommodate way more people one light bulb at a time by simply providing them a strategy, a protocol, for figuring out how to, do, how to do this yourself. And so that was really more of a rhetorical device to say, look, I know that you can't see, you have no front facade anymore, but, but the typology, you can pick from as many, you know, if you want to have a round courtyard or an oval or whatever you want, you can still preserve the sense of individual identity that is so important to you and was a reason for your being in suburbia in the first place. I think that's a really important point. Because in fact, uh, there's, uh, who was it that did a study in uh, Toronto of parcel sizes and demonstrated as the size of the parcel went up in scale, the quality of the environment went down. Yeah. Because of these gigantic things, which a developer friend called moon shops. Uh, I asked him, I said, you know, you have a review, urban design review, and many people will say, oh, you can't do small parcels or you can't do this. They want uh, big box things and so on. And I asked, he was a de LA developer, and he built his own practice on uh, doing smaller projects because they're economically less risky and you overall can make as much profit. 
And he's the one who said, we call those moon shots. If they go off and they hit the target, then it's great, you store it big. But most of the time they don't, and you lose tons of money. Mm -hmm. So there's a real argument for fine grain, finer grain uh, urban activity. taking the opportunity to bring up an issue that was brought before, this idea of scaling uh, as a way in which we begin to understand our architecture over it and many other sides of it where we decide to define uh, architectural issues, not necessarily by team, but, but the scale. So for example, if you talk about the domestic scale, there is a scalar uh, dimension to the project. So if, if you go from the idea that you can sort of uh, almost infect a culture by developing like, architectural strategies, like the one in Los Angeles that have changed the way that we perceive uh, the condition and, and create culture that transformed us one end of the scale. The other end of the scale of uh, the first, the whole revolution in or, or sorry legislation change in China that has traditionally separated the countryside from the city. So by, by changing that the whole group, uh, legislation is allowing every person in the countryside to register as a citizen in the city and own, own a you know, piece of inhabitation. And that's going to have a, a huge uh, effect in the way that cities are constructed, the way that the countryside is constructed. So <coughs> when, when you talk about this idea of production, 
it's a similar issue of the scale. There is a, there's a global the scale where we now consume things and production that comes from all over the world, right? And it produces a, a phenomenon that, for instance, Keller Easterly has an ally very, very clearly in sort of free zones, these kind of strange areas where legislation doesn't occur. And, and I think that's really interesting. But there's also another scale, for instance, places like London, where the creative industries have gentrified entire areas. Now there's a whole movement of actually bringing production, industrial production, but uh, uh, you know, the sort of digital production into the city. So that this, this whole, you know, every time, every, every thing we, we take, it, it seems to, to have its own complexity and its own scale. And I think in order to understand that, you kind of generalize as a single scale, but actually understand the different scale, which is one of the six that I might produce from. Which is established the boundary with which the city can grow so that it 
forces everybody to testify. Another skill would be a very specific strategic condition, like the uh, corridor, right? Where, uh, what's the name of the corridor? The connected corridor. The connected corridor, thank you. Uh, uh, the connected corridor that is implied that there is a point of intensity in the city that is not dense. You can inject a moment of density and that would be a generator, that's another strategy. And the third one, which is like more political and sad, is the bus station. You know, the buses in downtown used to be at an intersection of Salai and Jefferson, where all, all the people that actually need public transportation congregate, and it starts to generate its own economy, shops and support, but it, that was against the real estate value of that area. So this is the only moment in which the city invests in a big infrastructure project to actually move the bus station out of the, of the primary moment of possible intensity of possible density, if possible exchange between different social classes, different, different ethnic groups, it's actually the night and, and, and exclude and edited out. So in a way, it brings back this issue that Teddy Kuh said, that, that, that urbanity is, is density of like social exchanges, not just the value of bodies or, or building, but social mm -hmm. exchanges. So in a way, by neutralizing the possibility of, of social exchanges, one is denying the possibility of that urban density that could occur otherwise. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Did I scare you enough to make you rethink what you're doing? Yes, I will.